like to welcome everyone here today to our worship services at the Finley Church of Christ, especially to our visitors. We're glad that you came our way today, and at this time we would like to ask you to fill out one of the blue cards off the pew back in front of you. We would also like to welcome those who are listening by way of radio and hope that you might join us in the future if you have the opportunity. Those men leading us in our worship today, leading our singing, Greg Wilhite, First Prayer, Darren Norris, Reading, Danny Seals, Heading the Table, Bucky Floyd, Sermon, Dwight Fuqua, and Closing Prayer, Don Hillis. Next, I'm going to be on the screen, Higher Ground. I press the
Our next song will be on the screen, The Longer I Serve Him. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all your blessings you give us each day. Thank you for this time that we can come to you in prayer. For we know that if we ask, you give. Father, we pray this morning for the sick of this congregation, for those that are in, in recovery, for those that are undergoing tests in the upcoming week. Father, we pray that your will be done and that you will be with them and their families in the times of their struggles help them and they will look to you in word in your word and in prayer for comfort father we thank you for this time that we can come and worship you this morning we pray that we will do the things that will be pleasing to you we pray that the word taught this morning we will take it we'll apply it to our lives that we may become closer to you be better christians we will lead souls to you. Father, we pray for our country, pray for the leaders, pray for all those uh, that are involved in the upcoming uh, election. Father, we pray that your will will be done and we will all look to your word for the guidance that we need to make decisions we have to make and that they will do the same. Father, we, as we go throughout this service, we mindful that of your love for us and we're thankful for that and father we hope that we hope and pray that we do the things in this service that are pleasing to you in jesus name we pray amen please mark your books at number 36 number 36 christ receive a sinful man will be the song after the lesson that we'll use as a song of invitation and our song before the lesson will be 295, 295, A Beautiful Life.
would please stand for our scripture reading. Scripture reading this morning will be taken from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. That's Hebrews chapter 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Good morning. morning. Pam and I had a wonderful week last week with the Cedar Springs Church in Louisville, Kentucky. The meeting was very successful. We are very appreciative of your prayers on our behalf for our safety and travel and for the success of the meeting, and we are glad to be home this morning. Uh, Country boy doesn't belong in the city. I can take it for a short time, but uh, that I'm glad to be back in Sparta, Tennessee, and and back among uh, my family here. I want you to know that the lesson that I'm presenting this morning is, is not presented out of malice and strife. I want you to know that this lesson is presented out of genuine concern for those of you who are putting the Lord somewhere other than first place in your life. I want to talk to you this morning about your attendance at worship. I certainly do not need to say anything to some of you because you are here every time the doors are open. Your interest is commendable and your example in this regard is wonderful. You are faithful in attendance. I can see that and others can see that and I can simply say to you, well done. But I need to say something to those of you who are not in the group that I was just describing. You are not attending worship as you should. And by worship, I mean all of the services of the church, not just Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. I want you to think about the fact that when you choose to miss the worship, Or you allow other things to come before the worship that you are forsaking the assembly. You know what the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, but let me read it to you anyway. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm sure some of you, by this point, in your minds are saying, Preacher, why do you continually harp on attendance? Well, I would like to respond to that with three answers. First of all, I don't harp on attendance. To harp is to talk persistently and tediously. How long has it been since I have done a lesson on forsaking the assembly. It has been quite a while. If you feel like I am preaching on forsaking the assembly every week, uh, then maybe you need to listen to what I'm saying when I do preach about forsaking the assembly. Preacher, why do you harp about attendance, about worship? Folks, a part of my job as a preacher is to set in order the things that are lacking Titus chapter 1, verse 5. And like Peter, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. I simply cannot sit quietly by while you're putting your soul in jeopardy. I want you to know that I'm really trying to be your friend. In the words of Paul, have I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. Galatians 4 and verse 16. Preacher, why do you harp about attendance? I am not talking about attendance. I'm talking about a lack of attendance. And if the problem did not exist, 
there would be no need to discuss it. But because the problem does exist, there is a need to discuss it. All that you have to do is compare our attendance at Sunday school and on Sunday night and on Wednesday night with attendance on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. During the first three quarters of this year, January through September, we averaged 202 people in our service at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. We averaged 135 people at our services on Sunday night. That's 67 less people on Sunday night than on Sunday morning at 10. On Wednesday evening, we averaged 132. That's 70 less people on Wednesday night than at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. And so 33% less on Sunday night and 35% less on Wednesday night. Somebody says, well, what about Sunday school at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning compared with the morning worship at 10 a.m.? Well, a lot of you came in this morning for this service, but you were not here for Sunday school. Why not? Why not? A more accurate way of assessing the problem is to take the total number of our members, the membership list, subtract the visitors and those who cannot be here because of age, illness, etc. I don't have those figures. And I am sure that when you factor in our visitors and you factor in children and those who cannot be here because of age or illness, then the percentage of our members who are absentee are not as high as the figure shown on the board. But the problem still exists. By the way, our elders know those figures because whether you're aware of it or not, our elders check the attendance of every member at every service of the church. What I'm addressing today is your lack of attendance because... I'm concerned about your soul. I'm preaching to you, I'm speaking to you, my heart to your heart this morning because you are forsaking the assembly and you are displeasing God. No one who forsakes the assembly can say that the kingdom comes first in their life. Are you listening? No one who forsakes the assembly can say that the kingdom comes first in his or her life. Well, preacher people are going to do what they want to do. That may be true, but God wants us to choose to do his will. And my job is to tell you his will. The master said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it, Luke 11, verse 28. And so the question I want to pose this morning is this. Are you a servant of God? Are you the kind of servant of God that you ought to be? I hope you listen closely to what I'm about to say. That being a servant of God involves commitment. How much of our lives should we give to God? All of it. To be servants of God, we must deny even ourselves. In Luke chapter 14, verse 25, the Bible says, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. 
The reference of hating in verse 26 was a Hebrew way of saying to love less. The point is that we must love God before the people that are most intimate in our lives. We must love God before our own lives. That God must come before everything. It is true that one could attend all of the services of the church and still be lost. It is equally true that there is more to being faithful than just attending the services. But how can one be a servant of God, i.e. walk with the Lord, when they reject opportunities, opportunities afforded them to worship Him, to learn His will, to grow spiritually, and to support His cause? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3 as I pose this question to you today. Where is your heart? How much emphasis are you placing on the church in your life? Why is it that some people demonstrate more love for the Lord than others do? Did you cringe a little when I asked that? Well, God certainly wants all of us to be saved, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. And God doesn't want any of us to perish, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. But He cannot and He will not save those who are indifferent. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14, Jesus writes to the church at Laodicea, and as he told all of the other churches in verse 15, he said, I know your works. But then of this church, he said, you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. As you go on reading in that letter, you see in verse 17 that they had a different perspective about their spirituality than the Lord did. They thought everything was fine. They thought they were rich. But the Lord did not see them that way. And the Lord told them that they need to change their lives, that the shame of their nakedness might not be revealed. In verse 19, he said, For as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. The Lord told them that he was standing at the door of their heart and knocking in verse 20. And then in verse 21, he exhorted them to overcome. He cannot, he will not save those who are indifferent. And so we each do well to ask ourselves, where's my heart? How much emphasis am I really placing on the kingdom, on the church? A servant of God is one who is committed to God. How deep is your spiritual commitment? How many of you here are married? Well, let's illustrate with that. I want you to think about the commitment that you made in marriage. How deep that commitment was. For better, for worse, richer, poor, sickness and health, until death do us part. That's a very serious and a very deep commitment, isn't it? Well, when we turn to Romans chapter 7, verse 4, we read that we who are Christians are married to Christ. And so our devotion to the Lord must be of the deepest kind. What is devotion? It is ardent attachment and affection. It's loyalty. People aren't very devoted who only attend worship one hour a week. I am not talking about the aged. I am not talking about the sick. I am not talking about those who are otherwise hindered from attending. How can a congregation have 202 people on Sunday morning at 10, but only 135 people on Sunday night, 132 people on Wednesday night? Why do more people attend at 10 a.m. than at 9 a.m.? Because that's worship, too.
too. How many people waltz in at 10 o'clock when they could have been here at 9 o'clock and act like they haven't done anything wrong? Well, you have. Unless there is some physical reason why you cannot be here. I guess a lot of people feel like, and I hope you're not one of them, that you meet your duties to the Lord by being present one hour a week. If that is any of our attitude, then 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, let no one deceive himself. I know that the things that I'm saying to you are hard sayings this morning. And I assure you that I take no pleasure in saying them. But I'm encouraging each of us to examine our commitment to the Lord. When just about anything can keep you away from worship, a ball game, recreation, a TV program, puttering around the house, no reason at all. When anything, just about anything can keep you away from worship, then you need to check your heart. Is it good to worship God? Is it good to study His Word? Is it good to fellowship with God and with His people? Well, James said in James chapter 4 and verse 17, To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is, say it, sin. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Why is it that some people can travel a great distance and then walk miles to attend a ball game? They endure heat and cold, blistering sun or rain, and not to mention obnoxious fans. And they'll do that, but they can't come to worship. Well, it comes down to this. In Matthew 6 and 21, Jesus said, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Our attitude about attending the services of the church is what we make it. And having the right attitude will help us go a long way in creating the habit of attending all of the assemblies of the saints. David certainly had a good attitude in Psalm 122 and verse 1 when he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our attendance speaks legion. I want you to know that there's a parking lot sermon going on out there this morning. Out front, out back. There's a parking lot sermon going on. Those who are driving by from our community are assessing our commitment to Christ. And guess what? They'll do it again tonight at 6 o'clock. And they'll do it again Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. And they're noticing how many were coming in just before the 10 o'clock service when our worship started at 9 o'clock. They're gauging our devotion by our attendance. God is gauging our devotion by our attendance. Our brethren are gauging our devotion by our attendance. Shouldn't we, at least in part, gauge our own devotion by our own attendance? You see, our attendance pattern is speaking to our friends and our neighbors. And it's especially speaking to the members of our family. Mom and Dad, I have a special message for you. What is your attendance pattern saying to your children? I've thought often about this poem. A little girl with shining eyes, her little face aglow. 
I said, Daddy, it's almost time for Sunday school. Let's go. They teach us there of Jesus' love, of how he died for all, upon the cruel cross to save those who on him call. Oh no, said Daddy, not today. I've worked hard all this week. And I must have one day of rest. I'm going to the creek. For there I can relax and rest, and fishing's fine, they say. So run along, don't bother me. We'll go to church someday. Months and years have passed away, and Daddy hears that plea no more. Let's go to Sunday school. Those childhood days are over. And now that Daddy's growing old, when life is almost through, he finds the time to go to church, but what does daughter do? She says, oh, Daddy, not today. I've stayed up most all night, and I've just got to have some sleep. Besides, I look a fright. Then Daddy lifts a trembling hand to brush away his tear. And again he hears the pleading voice distinctly through the years. He sees a small girl's shining face upturned with eyes aglow. As she says, it's time for Sunday school. Please, Daddy, won't you go? Now, I know some of you older parents are hurting because you were not as faithful as you should have been during the formative years of your children, and so your children are not faithful now. I'm not trying to inflict more pain on you. I, I would simply encourage you to be faithful and try to correct what you can. But I especially have a message for those of you with children in your home. Bring those children to every service. Let them know that God takes priority because worship takes priority. Putting other things before worship is putting other things before God. It speaks legion to your children now. And it will show in their lives later. Show priority to God by showing priority to worship. Putting other things before worship is putting other things before God. We can all, whether we're young or old, whether we're single or married... We can all be an example to others by our faithful attendance at all of the services of the church. And by the way, in case you've missed it, it is not okay to forsake the assembly. You can fool yourself. You might even fool some others. But you can't fool God. And in your heart, I really think that you know that what you're doing is not right. Well, why not make the commitment to assemble with the saints every time they meet? You are missing so much by not being in your place. If you have not been faithful repent get right with God become a Bible believing Bible respecting Bible practicing person again if you do not repent in the words of Jonathan to David you will be missed because your seat will be empty 1 Samuel 20 and verse 18. Every person present tonight and every person present Wednesday night will know how you responded to God's message today. Will it be just so much water off the duck's back again? Or will you change? What will the Lord say to you on the judgment day? Will he say, well done, good and faithful servant, or will he say, depart from me? Look deep into your heart and answer this question. Am I the servant of God that I ought to be? 
Somebody might say, when I preach her, my name is on the roll. Don't let that fool you. The Bible says that when Jesus comes, his angels will gather out of his kingdom those who practice lawlessness. Matthew 13, 41. You need to think about that. I've tried to be very careful in my tone this morning. I've tried not to sound condemning or be too preachy. I hope you've listened. And if you're not a Christian this morning, I realize that the lesson that has just been presented has not been presented with you in mind directly this morning. But we want you to know, and we encourage you, to become a Christian. To become a servant of God. How do you do that? Well, that's what the people on Pentecost wanted to know. In Acts 2 and 37, believing the message of Peter that Jesus was the Christ who was raised from the dead and that they were guilty of crucifying him, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And an immediate response to that in Acts 2 and 38, Peter told them to repent and to be baptized for the remission of their sins. You have the opportunity today to be baptized into Christ. You have the opportunity today to repent and come home and be faithful. Take advantage of heaven's invitation. Won't you come?